very warm welcome to everyone. Um, thanks for cooperating with this business of uh, wearing masks and all the rest of it. Um, we're indebted to you all for uh, being so uh, cooperative. Well, this morning we're going to begin with a familiar hymn, Immortal, Invisible. It's a hymn of praise, of worship. And you remember last week we were thinking that we can really bring pleasure to God. We do bring pleasure to God when we worship him, recognising that Christ is our mediator, that Christ is the sacrifice whereby we come to him. And as we sing this hymn, we won't get any reference to that, but I'm sure we'll be thinking of it in our hearts as we come and rejoice in this almighty God. And we remember that it was this almighty creator God who so loved the world that he gave his son. So that'll be in our minds as we sing together. And so we'll make a real effort uh, as we um, have, the, have these masks on, uh, but we'll know the Lord hears and the Lord is pleased. So let's give pleasure to the Lord as we stand together and sing from the accompaniment that you'll see on the screen.
And so we'll pray. And so our Father, we do come to you in worship as we recognise your love and goodness to us. We thank you that you gave your Son for us. We thank you as we come into your presence. We know you are almighty, you are the creator God, and yet you have a heart of love towards mankind. And we've benefited from that as we've realised that Christ is the way we can come to you. And we thank you for all the grace that you have shown us, for all the opportunities that we've had as you've shown yourself to us. So we thank you that we can come together with worship in our hearts, rejoicing in what you have done for us. And we want to pray for ourselves today as we have this opportunity of being together. We pray that you will be helping us helping with the technical challenges that we face, helping with us with our need to hear, to listen uh, to what you have to say to us. We pray that you will be blessing each one of us. We think of Michael there in Keswick. We pray for him and his family that he'll be having a, a good refreshing time this week and that it will really be a, a blessing to him. We pray for those others who are on holiday that wherever they are you will be watching over them. If they have opportunity to meet with your people we pray that that will be a, a blessed experience and we pray that they will come back refreshed from their time away. And we think of Chaco and Rada committed to ministry today. We pray that you will help them. And we especially pray for Rada as she speaks to the women at this meeting that she'll be at. We pray that you will be helping them as they would seek to discharge the responsibility that you have given uh, to them. And then we would pray for any in the church who are struggling, who are facing difficulties with problems, we pray that you will be their strength, you will be their help. And we think of the whole church of God spread through the world, worshipping you we trust today. We pray that you will be with them, even as we would seek that you would be with ourselves. And so we give you thanks and look to you for your blessing. In the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, now we're going to sing about Christ, uh, the hymn, You're the Word of God the Father. Um, again, we'll stand to sing with the words on the screen. Oh, 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 
Do be seated. Um, now some notices. After the service, there'll be tea and coffee. Um, we'll look forward to you uh, being able to come and uh, take part in that. Um, this evening um, on Zoom, uh, there'll be a, a Bible study. It's based on uh, David Cook speaking at Word Alive. We'll look at a, a video um, on Proverbs um, chapter 7 and 9, and then we'll have a, a discussion uh, after that. Next Sunday, uh, Michael will be back. Uh, Paul is going to be speaking, and he's speaking on the subject, Before I Die. I'm sure we'll want to hear what he's got to say. And next Sunday evening, the study in Proverbs will continue. So that's the, the notices uh, for today. And now we're going to have a reading, and Michael Johnson is going to come and read for us. Yeah. Can you take that? Yeah. <clears throat> the reading this morning is taken from Exodus chapter 20, beginning at the first verse. Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honour your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbour. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. 
God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Well, a a word to the children. Um, The children who were here a fortnight ago saw a picture of the tabernacle that was shown to them by George. And last week we were thinking a bit about that tabernacle or tent of meeting. Now, Michael, our pastor and his family, this morning... Uh, We'll be in a a tent of meeting, uh, but it's a very different sort of tent. Um, The tent at Keswick, they keep presumably in storage during the year, and then they put it up on a concrete base on a site that is there. So the tent at Keswick is in the same place all the time. Now, the tent of meeting in the Old Testament was very different. Um, They had to take it down and then they moved it and then uh, they put it up again and they went on like that for a considerable number of years. Uh, More years than your parents have been alive, in fact. So it was very, very different. Now, shifting a tent, a big tent, is a tricky business and it was laid down there was a plan and it tells us that particular people had particular jobs and uh, they had to do the job that was assigned to them that's repeated often (laughs) it was a job that was assigned a job that It meant that they were to do. No one else was going to do it. They were responsible. And the jobs were very different. Some, you might think, were rather jolly jobs, you know, jobs you'd like to do. Carrying articles of gold, for instance. That's rather good. Um, Some people had to put up with carrying tent pegs. You might think, well, that's not a very exciting thing to do. But it was laid down. If you were to carry a tent peg, you had to get on and carry a tent peg. And when you think about it, whilst you might think some are more important than others, when you come to be putting up the tent, you need everything. If you haven't got the tent pegs because the people were just fed up because they weren't carrying something they thought was valuable, um, well, you wouldn't have been able to put the tabernacle up at all. And so it was important that everyone did what they were supposed to do. And it's true for us. And I want to say, especially to the children, it can be true for children as well. There's a job for them to do. There's a story in the Old Testament of a a girl, a slave girl, and She just said to her mistress, there's someone in Israel who could really help the master here. And it was a small thing to say, but it had tremendous repercussions. As a result of that, a really important man came to trust God. And When I was at school, I remember a boy saying, well, in the Civic Hall in Croydon, um, there's going to be somebody speaking who's the best, I think he said something about the best speaker in the country, and he'd be speaking about Christianity. And I thought, well, that would be a good thing to go to. And so I did. And that was how I came to hear the gospel. It was a boy in school being enthusiastic about something. 
So that's something for us all to remember. There may be small things that we're called upon to do, a bit of a tent peg. We might not have particularly important things. Most people don't. Uh, but those things that we can do are important. So remember that, please. Um, it might seem to be just a tent peg. But in the grand scheme of things, it can be really important. Well, now we're going to sing again. Um, it's one in which we express something of our desire for God. I trust we'll all be able to sing this really from the heart. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. the second of two Sundays in which we are looking at the book of Leviticus, the third book of the Bible. Um, the Lord said to Moses, that's our subject. Um, last week we looked at the Lord said to Moses. And we began looking at the instructions that God gave 
all the people through Moses. And we focused then, last week, on the, the way the people were to approach him. Um, here's a reminder of what was said last week for those who were here, and it will be a catch-up for those who were not with us. We saw that the ceremonials of the Old Testament are to illustrate heavenly things. And we saw that when we come to the New Testament, we're told that the reality of them is found in Christ. So we look at these pictures and we see how they're pointing to Christ and the significance that it is for us. And we saw that the way to God was not a matter of choice. There was one way. There was a path to God. And it was, in fact, the only way. And then we saw that, as we looked at the offerings, that right worship, brings God pleasure. Worship that's recognising that Christ is the way to God brings him pleasure. And finally, we saw that the people of God are not expected to be guilty of intentional sin. Well, this morning's title is... I am the Lord, your God. Last week, we looked then at the offerings. We saw that the ceremonials made it clear that we have come to God. We come to him on his terms and in the way he directs. And this morning, we're going to be looking at chapter 19 of Leviticus, where we'll find it, it gives a wide range of commands and we will look at some of them only time to look at a few and we'll aim to see how they can help us as we seek to live our lives out as Christians so let's pray we pray Father that you will be helping me as I seek to explain your word pray that you'll help me in my weakness and we pray that you will help us all as we would seek to listen to what you are saying to us we pray that we might have open ears to the speaking of God through the Holy Spirit this morning Amen now there is a quite natural objection. If we value freedom, there's a suspicion of motive. And when it comes to rules laid down by God, folk are often suspicious. Is God on our side? And it's, it's often alleged that such rules are designed to limit our enjoyment. So, what do you say to someone who says this to you? I don't want to be told what to do. Well, usually, those who complain about what the Bible says haven't spent enough time reading it to see what it actually does say. And my answer would be, well, take a good look at these rules. Think about them. Ask yourself... Well, what would life be like if all these rules were kept? What would my life be like if these divine rules were universally obeyed? Scattered through chapter 19, we find this statement, I am the Lord your God. It occurs in various combinations. It's repeated over and over again. If the people of God are to welcome his commands and obey them, they need to grasp what this means. 
Here the statement introduces the Ten Commandments in Exodus. We heard it this morning. What follows is important. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I am the God who brought you out of slavery. They were to see God in that light. Let's think for a moment about what had happened. Abraham had been chosen. He was promised a dynasty, a land. He was promised he'd be a blessing to the whole world. And those promises were repeated to Abraham's son Isaac and Isaac's son Jacob. And then the chosen family, 70 in all, go to Egypt so that they can escape famine. But disaster strikes. The warm welcome they had evaporates. And 400 years later, having multiplied considerably, they are enslaved by the Egyptians. Where is God? What has happened? But their faith holds. They ignore the many gods of Egypt and they pray to the God of the covenant, the one who made the promises to Abraham and the patriarchs. And God intervenes in a spectacular fashion. Moses is provided to confront Pharaoh and lead the people out. God tells them the promises to Abraham are still on track. The promised land is still ahead. But they know very little about God or his ways. So God speaks extensively through Moses. And the more we understand the background the more we can see the force of the argument. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I am the Lord your God. I've rescued you. I have a future for you. Trust me. This is how our chapter, chapter 19, starts. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every member of the people of God needed to hear this. Be holy because I, the Lord God, am holy. I am different. You must be different. It wasn't a recommendation, you notice. It wasn't just advice. There's a lot of difference between a recommendation and a commandment. If one thing I learned when my years in the army, it was that. It was a command. And the chapter is largely short, pithy commands. They cover a variety of behaviour. What does it mean to be holy? That's what we'll be seeing this morning. And we'll see it's not a pious remoteness from life in general. And it won't be lost on us that Peter applies this same very demanding command to ourselves. Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. We are to be different. After that, um, by way of introduction, we have this. Each of you must respect your mother and father and you must observe my Sabbaths. I 
and the Lord your God. Two very different commands, both musts, both involving recognition and respect. The first one applying to family relationships. Mother comes first. I imagine that's because our mothers do a lot more f for us before we're born than our fathers. And they certainly do a lot more for us in our early years. And this, having respect for your mother and father, is holiness in action. I wonder if you thought of that. Respect for parents is holiness. And the people of God need to view their parents with respect. And then respect for God. The people are to observe the Sabbaths. They're to rest. They're to give themselves time to reflect on God's blessings and his will. And important as their work was, it wasn't to be the end all and be all of their lives. It follows that if I am the Lord your God, if the God of the covenant is their God, there'll be many alternatives to be excluded. So how does that work out? They won't seek alternatives. Well, in verse 4 it says this, Do not turn to idols, or make metal gods for yourselves. I am the Lord your God. So if the Lord is their God, there can be no substitutes or even additions. All idolatry is excluded. Their trust is to be in the Lord alone. And how difficult that proved to be. It became their undoing in the end. And the temptation to trust the visible rather than the invisible was and is very difficult to resist. And Paul reminds us that idolatry is not confined to gods of wood, stone or metal. Put to death, therefore, he says, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Whenever we follow the desires of our earthly nature, when we are putting ourselves and our desires first, we are repudiating God's rule. And that's idolatry. It's an immense challenge. But the people of God need to face it. And then in verse 26 we see this. Do not practice divination or seek omens. Maybe in your version you've got sorcery for seek omens. Now, I don't suppose they ever practice the art of reading tea leaves. But all such contrived methods of gaining information or discovering the future, were forbidden. The Lord was to be sought regarding decisions and behaviour. He alone knows the future and what is best for us. And then in verse 31 it says this, Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. The way to God was clear. There was only that way. Any alternative method was bogus. It wasn't only useless, it would be defiling. It would bring no good and would be harmful uh, to those who tried. And here's a command with a very temporary uh, feel. 
When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not ill treat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love him as yourself. For you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. We have an innate tendency to put ourselves first, and then we put our family next, and then we put our kindred spirits. But those are not the priorities of God's people. Notice how thoroughgoing it is. It's not just don't ill treat them, although it is that, but it's love them as yourself. And the reason? I am the Lord your God. That's the way I behave. I loved you when you were foreigners in Egypt, so this is the way you must behave. When we first come across this command, it's a real eye-opener. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. Surely we'd say anyone's aim is to maximise the yield. That's what business is about. That's why we work. But no, the Israelites were to make provision for the poor and the needy. I am the Lord your God. That's what I do. That's what you must do. How utterly radical it is. But of course the Lord is utterly radical. He's utterly different. And so his people are to be utterly different as well. Do not defraud or rob your neighbour. Do not hold back the wages of a hired worker overnight. I remember one day in the staff room at Catford School listening to the head of RE pontificating on his method of delaying paying any bills to the last possible day. He regarded it as clever and was proud of it. But many self-employed are crippled in their finances because their clients don't pay them by the due date. And the people of God were to be distinguished by paying off all debts promptly. Now here's a verse that might well strike some as a bit weird. Keep my decrees, do not make different kinds of animals, do not plant your field with two kinds of seed, do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. Well, this is part of the ceremonial law and it's making a point. We've seen that the people of God were to be separate, they were to be distinguished from the nation surrounding them. So, any mixture of worship and values was to be guarded against. The people were to be an example, an example to the nations around them. And these ceremonial rules were to remind them that mixture was to be avoided. Mixture of worship, mixture of values. But that doesn't mean to say that I'm careful to look at the label on my pullover to see if it's of mixed material. But it does raise an important point. How do we distinguish between the moral laws that apply to us today and the ceremonial laws that were only illustrations so do not apply today? Well, there are those who argue today that since there are laws in the Old Testament that don't apply today, then it follows there is no reason why we should regard 
Old Testament commands, for example, relating to homosexual behaviour as applying today? Well, the answer is very simple. The commands that we need to take seriously are repeated and confirmed by Jesus or his apostles in the New Testament. That's how we distinguish between ceremonial and moral laws uh, for today. Now, this verse is the only place in the Old Testament where this phrase appears. Love your neighbour as yourself. It's useful to see it in its original context. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbour frankly so that you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord. Loving your neighbour can well mean rebuking them frankly so that you don't share their guilt. Loving your neighbour clearly does not mean merely aiming to be on good terms. Rather, it means being so concerned for them that you will risk offending them for their ultimate good. It's part of our duty of care. And this is how the chapter ends. Do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, weight or quantity. Use honest scales and honest weights, an honest ephah and an honest hen. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Keep all my decrees and all my laws and follow them. I am the Lord. It's a plea for honesty in commerce that there should be no deception. And surely we would all relish a world where such deception is unknown. And the reason, yet again, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Then the insistence, this is not a case of choosing which ones you tackle, which ones you ignore. No, it's keep all my decrees and all my laws and follow them. And then for the 15th time in the chapter, I am the Lord brings the chapter to an end. Now I said earlier that when we understand the background, we can see the force of the argument. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I've rescued you, I've got a future for you, trust me. My commands are not to restrict you, they are for your good. Now, we re need to realise that we don't just learn from the laws and ceremonial of the Old Testament, but we learn too uh, from their history. And the history of the Lord's people in the Old Testament mirrors our own. We too were chosen. Chosen in Christ before the creation of the world. Chosen to be holy and blameless in his sight. And we too were in a dangerous situation. Slaves to sin is what Paul calls the dominion of darkness. That's where we are. So our rescue through Christ was unparalleled. God's sinless son was a sacrifice for those who will trust him. 
And there followed forgiveness for sin, a righteousness from God, God to be our Father, Christ to be our Saviour and Lord, and an eternity ahead with God in the kingdom of his Son. What, what could possibly match that? That is our experience. That is why these Old Testament passages uh, can be so helpful. And it's a reason why it's so important that we immerse ourselves in and encourage one another to immerse themselves in the teaching that we now have that come through Jesus, the prophets in the Old Testament and the apostles in the New. Now, we are concluding with an incident from the New Testament. We'll go through it quickly. One of the teachers of the law came, heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. And he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one answered Jesus is this. Hear me, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no command greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You're right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbour as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. I trust that this morning we are freshly impressed with the importance of these commands taught so many years ago through Moses, then through Jesus as he spoke on this earth and emphasised in the New Testament that we read today. And then finally, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples in Luke's Gospel. Love your enemies, do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. You will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. That's what we need, motivation. Most of us have the desire most, if not all of us, have the intention. Where we fail is that we so often just don't do it. And we're told here the Most High, our Heavenly Father, is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Of course, we know that. He has been kind to us. He is ready to be kind to all who will trust him. So let's show respect for our Heavenly Father and ourselves be merciful to the ungrateful and wicked. Despite the difficulty, despite past failures, the reward is great. And we will know that we are behaving as the most high children should behave. Let's pray. And so, Father, we do 
look to you, that you will be speaking to us. You read our hearts, you see our desire. We pray that we will be those who are living this utterly different life as we follow your commands, as we seek to love you, as we seek to love our neighbours. We pray that we will know the strength that you give through the Holy Spirit, that we will be able to obey such commands and live our lives to your glory. We ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. And our final hymn uh, will be Tell Out My Soul. Now, when we sing this one usually, we're thinking about what we're saying. I, I tr would like to think that this morning we'll think about not only what we're saying, but how we're living. So we'll sing together, Tell Out My Soul. Our Father, we thank you for the time we've spent together. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your speaking. And we commend one another to your love and care. In the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. <laughs>